So socialists are coping, and quite frankly, seething. And specifically, Cenk Uygur's nephew made a video response to me, which is probably one of the worst political videos I have ever seen in my entire life. I know I say that in almost every video I ever make, but yeah, yeah, this one's bad. So we're just gonna jump right into it, uh, see what he has to say, um, and see if we can find anything that's over 100 IQ points. Uh, it's gonna be pretty hard, I think. If America loves democracy so much, why don't we have democracy in the workplace? Like, we love freedom, but when we go to work, we just start taking orders from someone, no questions asked? How about the workers choose their managers rather than the other way around? How about when management is coming up with policies that directly affect the worker? Why don't the workers have a say in creating those policies? So there's many reasons why this is... Okay, so the first guy is classic. This is like... First guy is a Richard Wolf Andy. Okay, I already know. Of course, I don't personally disagree with that take. I agree with it. Let's see what he has to say, though. This guy... This guy looks like he's about to intellectually dismantle him, okay? This is incredibly stupid. First of all, logically, just because something affects you doesn't mean you should have a say in it. If 50 people... Wait, what? Just because logically? Bro, you can't just say logically and then say whatever the fuck you want after it. And then people will be like, well, that guy's logical. <laughs> so this is the problem with people like Hassan and then others like Lance from the surfs. They watch videos and react to them and then they stop them halfway through an argument and then say something like, wow, this doesn't make sense yet. Well, yes, because the argument isn't done, right? So if I'm saying logically, you can't say, just because something affects you means it should be democratized. You can't stop right there and not let me finish explaining why, logically, just because something affects you means it should be democratized. So I proceed to talk about, for example, people being in my home. Them being in my home affects them. It does not mean they need to democratize my home. Some more examples include maybe a ship. Just because there are a bunch of passengers on a ship does not mean they should democratically decide where the ship is going to sail or how the ship is going to sail. That should be left up to a sort of meritocracy. The people who know how to handle the ship, the people who know how to fix the ship, the people who know how to navigate the ship, they should be in charge of their respective jobs. It should not be democratically run. The same with something like a bus. A bunch of people jumping on a bus doesn't mean they can democratically decide where the bus is going to go or democratically decide when the bus is going to get gas. This is fundamentally illogical. External and internal factors. But one of the major internal factors was distorted labor incentives. If your workplace is a democracy and not a meritocracy, you do not have incentives to perform better. Then we've got this paper from the National- You don't have- Okay, perform better by what metric, dude? By what metric? We never have this conversation. Every time people talk about efficiency, they're talking about efficiency from a capitalist point of view. And yes, if you look at efficiency from a capitalist point of view, obviously other kinds of organizations are probably not going to look like they're performing better. You have to look at the different kinds of metrics that, that help, like turnover rate, the workplace conditions, the happiness metrics, even though they're very qualitative and difficult to fucking uh, uh, fully comprehend. So let's go back and let's watch my video as I'm talking about Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia actually once had a system entirely made up of worker cooperatives. And this is a great paper from the London School of Economics analyzing this. This worker cooperative system in Yugoslavia increased unemployment, decreased job finding rates, even increased the natural rate of unemployment. At one point, more than 20% of the workforce was working in other countries because they couldn't find jobs in Yugoslavia. The authors pointed out there was external and internal factors, but one of the major internal factors was distorted labor incentives. So the nephew of Cenk from the Young Turks thinks that unemployment is not a good signifier of workers' conditions. How on earth can high unemployment be good for workers? That has to be bad for workers. Less people being able to find jobs was a bad thing. As for distorted labor incentives, let's go back to the paper. The labor wedge is quantitatively the most important determinant of the retardation of Yugoslavia's economic growth which of course is similar to the retardation of Cenk Uygur's nephew. The labor wedge corresponds with the discrepancy between the marginal rate of substitution between consumption and leisure and the marginal product of labor. The labor wedge is related to the structure of incentives determining the provision of labor. It is often interpreted as synonymous with the distortive effect caused by labor taxation. The labor wedge embarked on a steady worsening trend since 1965. This coincides with the 1965 socio-economic reforms. 
these reforms allowed the work councils of labor-managed firms to distribute income between wages and investment. I argue that this allowed labor-managed firms to approach their governing object of maximizing income per worker, distorting the ability of Yugoslavs to provide labor. Through restricting new labor entry, the already employed workers gained at the cost of outsiders. Saying how much of the profits go back to them versus how much of the profits actually go to like, I don't know, marketing and shit like that. Okay, and it's most reductive, uh, it's most reductive take, that's what this does, okay? Turning a, a workplace, which is an authoritarian uh, style of governance into something that's closer to a democracy. So this whole thing of people being able to say, maximize their income through democratic voting, totally sounds nice and pretty and stuff. However, this still doesn't make any sense. Going back to the ship analogy, Plato in the Republic actually gave an analogy of a ship as a democracy. So the ship has a captain who is larger and stronger than any of the crew, but he's a bit deaf and short-sighted and kind of limited in seamanship. So each of the crew each thinks that they ought to be at the helm. They end up getting rid of the captain and they take over the ship themselves and run it democratically. Through that, they finally learn that the true navigator has to study the seasons of the year, the sky, the stars, the winds, and all of the subjects appropriate to his profession. A majority can't always make the right decisions. Someone cannot possibly seriously think this. There is no other field in which this works. Biology is not democratically run. Computer science is not democratically run. Militaries are not democratically run. So when you have people just trying to maximize their own income, just having their own best interest in mind, they're going to neglect things like investments, which I pointed this out in my video. And yes, you do need capitalist investments. You do need to make good business decisions. Because ultimately, if you don't do these things, then these workers are going to lose out on pay, and you're going to create less jobs. Ultimately, this will create worse conditions for the workers, and we've seen this happen, just like I pointed out in Yugoslavia. If you look at countries with higher unionization rates, their workers have significantly better benefits, and their workers are significantly happier. Unions are very different from worker cooperatives. I'm sitting here presenting empirical evidence and theoretical arguments against worker cooperatives, and he changes the subject entirely. Unions are not really workplace democracy. They're collective bargaining. And it's still to an extent they are meritocracy based. If it's a whole bunch of bad workers saying that they're not going to work until they get higher pay, then the reasonable thing is to replace them with equivalent or better workers. And unions, of course, are not going to have as many bad effects on investments and stuff like that. But anyways, Chenk's nephew wants to point out some random correlation he's seen. Look, I don't care how many little pretty correlation graphs you pop up about unions. Jenk's nephew is retarded, he doesn't know anything about labor economics, and he doesn't know anything about unions. I actually wish he hadn't even brought it up because I hate talking about unions. It's just such a complex issue that needs so much nuance. So I'm just going to refer to this paper in the Human Resource Management Journal. So this is a meta-analysis looking at workplace satisfaction and unionization. They observe a large negative correlation between unionization and overall job satisfaction. But when controlling for endogeneity, differences in job satisfaction between unionized and non-unionized workers disappears. So the thing was, it was just different types of workers that join workers' unions. They already have different levels of worker satisfaction prior to joining the unions, which is different from the other non-unionized workers. This is why it makes it so hard to compare unionized and non-unionized workers. Just looking at the US, we see despite a decrease in unionization, wages have steadily increased, income inequality has actually decreased, and worker benefits have increased. Comparing completely different countries without any sort of control or any sort of consideration of the economic and cultural differences in these countries is absolutely ludicrous and, again, retarded, and should not even remotely be taken seriously. But anyways, Jenks nephew, if you would like to know more about labor unions, I suggest asking your uncle. After all, he is a well-known union buster. For everyone else who'd like to learn more about labor unions, I suggest checking out William H. Hutt's paper. Bureau of Economic Research is one of the most major peer-reviewed economic journals in the world when labor has a voice in corporate governance. Our empirical findings reveal that long-standing labor voice in corporate governance is associated with significantly depressed shareholder value, sale growth, and job creation. No way, dude! No way! Are you telling me that shareholder value diminishes when workers have a say, dude? What? Fuck! That's it. That's it, bro. Yeah, that's the point, idiot! So right here, I swear to you, I could have said... 
Well, it decreases shareholder value and also all of the workers instantly die. And Jang's nephew still would have gone on an autistic screeching rant about, Yay! Decrease shareholder value, guys! This is great! This shows that fundamentally, Chang's nephew does not actually care about the workers. He only cares about hating the capitalists. He only cares about hating shareholders. He literally does not care about less jobs. He does not care about lower wages. There is an avoidance in certain types of investment, capital expenditure, R&D spending, and high-risk investments in general. The thing is, the average person isn't willing to make high-risk investments. So when you democratize the workplace, that's going to be reflected in the decision. No but way, that's terrible. Have a that's terrible, dude. What? No high-risk investments? What the fuck, dude? That sucks. Bro, this motherfucker is literally saying, when workers have a say in the seat of the table uh, on, on what to do with the profits that they generate through their labor, okay? If workers have a say in what to do with the profits of the company, they end up saying, hey, maybe we should spend some of that that we generated back on ourselves. Prioritizing safety and workplace conditions and better benefits for the workers that ultimately generate the profits regardless and create all the value is the appropriate way to go forward. It might not be the most efficient way from a capitalist mode of production standpoint, but it's still the right thing to do. It's the fair, more importantly than that, it's the fair thing to do. Why do I have to suffer through this? Okay, I think the paper actually puts this best. Over the seven-year comparison period, labor voice firms achieved average and median sales growth rates of 8.6 and 5.7% respectively, significantly below comparable figures for other firms at 13.8 and 8.7%, at 1% level or better. Perhaps more importantly, labor voice firms create only about half as many net new jobs as other firms. Note that to maintain or increase individual labor's wages while simultaneously increasing total labor force would require profitability and or efficiency improvements. It's almost like you need money for higher wages. This is essentially situational irony for Chank's nephew because now he's taking the position of his evil capitalist caricature. Now he's okay with screwing over new people in the workforce as long as others get higher wages, even though those people can't even maintain those higher wages because they don't have enough economic growth. Higher time preference and capitalists generally have a lower time preference. So owners are willing to make these high risk investments that will bring in high rewards down the road. This results in more growth and job creation. Yeah, totally dude. Yeah, owners wanting to improve shareholder value, okay? And uh, boards and corporations wanting to consistently grow and consistently increase shareholder value has been great for the American working class. Oh my God, so good. Exactly this, but unironically. In this literature review, the findings were still consistent. They found that worker cooperatives tended to have lower pay and worker cooperatives were constrained by financial difficulties, management inexperience, and interpersonal rivalry. The journals he's citing are looking at socialized workplaces from a capitalist mode of production standpoint. So of course, the metrics that they've designed the game for are going to be for capitalist metrics. Those capitalist metrics! Yes! Oh, yes! Yeah, uh, I I'm well aware that wages are a capitalist thing. Um, thank you for admitting that, uh, Mr. Chank's nephew. Um, you're kind of doing my job for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wages are capitalist, slavery is socialist. You are on the right path. You're almost there. You are almost there. And yes, job creation and the existence of jobs and the existence of production instead of everyone just starving to death, that is too a capitalist thing. You are getting there. I am so proud of you. So this guy goes from one minute talking about, well, yeah, the worker co-ops, the higher wages, yeah. And I'm like, well, worker co-ops tend to have lower wages. Um, actually, that's a capitalist metric because under socialism, there's no wages. People just work for, for nothing. Yeah. But not only that, but also the last thing I was going to say is like, there aren't that many worker cooperatives. The idea that they're getting paid lower wages is a falsehood. It's a capitalist metric that you shouldn't use. But also, it's not even true because I said so. Socialists usually cite Italy as a country with a lot of worker cooperatives because that is so. In Italy, the worker cooperatives tended to have 14% lower wages than the capitalist firms. This is from very large sample sizes as well. Okay, even unions, which are le more or less an entry point, okay? Unions, and there is a million different kinds of empirical studies conducted on this, universally 
increase your wages. Okay, okay. He can't stay on one subject. So labor unions, again, real quick. Higher wages in labor unions is mostly due to selection effects. Unions can raise wages for lower skilled workers, but this will often be at the expense of higher skilled workers and also at the expense of employment for lower skilled workers. It does in fact increase unemployment for lower skilled workers. And when unionization happens, higher skilled workers tend to go find new jobs. And some of these things actually happen in worker cooperatives as well. Higher skilled members are much more likely to leave worker cooperatives. This is because these egalitarian systems favor low skilled and low productivity people over the more skilled and more productive ones, the ones that people actually depend upon. When you have less jobs being created, this is actually going to decrease wages overall because you're going to have an abundance of extra labor and not as many jobs. And worker cooperatives made a modest, if any, contribution to the creation of new and good jobs. Making decisions in workplaces should be based off of meritocracy, not democracy. The only way that like wages could decrease, technically, in a more democratized uh, workplace would be if the CEO wages and the upper level management wages are lowered because, uh, you know, that's what they voted on. Democracy doesn't work. Look at our last two presidents, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. You really want to bring that kind of decision making to the workplace? Why is an anarcho-capitalist claiming that democracy doesn't work? Why is an anarcho-capitalist claiming that democracy doesn't work? What it, this is, this is, you're so pro-capitalist that there's no anarcho left in it, which is of course, anarcho-capitalism is oxymoronic regardless. Anarchism and capitalism clearly do not work because there's no voluntary cooperative fucking uh, way of working in a capitalist workplace. He's literally also making an argument entirely on, uh, on the side of authoritarianism and fascism. Wow, fascism? It would be crazy if there was a strong link between the worker cooperatives and economic fascism. Anarchists have always historically been against democracy, as it is literally a way to form a state. And anarchists are against a state. If the individual is owned by a 51% or larger majority, that is not an anarchist society. That is still a state. If the individual cannot own himself, that is slavery. And as for the whole voluntary thing, to claim that capitalism is involuntary is just one of the oddest things that the left does. No, don't pay him $15 to wash your car. No, that's literally rape. But at the same time, they think democracy is voluntary. Like in an orgy, if one person decides to leave, then it doesn't matter because the majority voted on it. So you just keep raping the dude. Democracy, am I right? But anyways, as for capitalism, people will say, oh, well, people don't have a choice. They have to work in order to survive. Well, yes, you have to work in order to survive. That's an aspect of nature itself. That's an aspect of living itself. We must have food. We must have production. Guess what? Under socialism, if no one works, then everyone's going to starve to death. This whole thing like, oh, but we have a social safety net. Well, who funds and runs the social safety net? Do they not have to work? Can 75% of people stop working and just be on a social safety net? Clearly not. So socialism still doesn't get past this work or die problem. What socialism does is it separates distribution from production. It makes promises of distribution without any plan or ability to fulfill them. Just because you claim in theory everyone can have a social safety net doesn't mean it's true. And in reality, your entire economic system is just placing the burden on fewer and fewer people. I'm, I'm not too hopeful for mankind. 